for this panel has mentioned uh, uh, entitled the tokenization of financial assets is finally here are you ready uh, my name is adrian zera i'm in charge of business development for nomadic labs which is a, a subsidiary of the Tezos foundation based in france and i am very pleased to have the opportunity to moderate this panel in the presence of very qualified professionals from the blockchain and um, tokenization industry and uh, i would like to begin this uh, panel with uh, this first question, uh, and maybe starting with you, for instance, uh, Nadia, what is your perspective regarding tokenization? Is the tokenization finally, finally here to stay or not? Thank you, Adrian. Uh, thank you, uh, everyone. Um, I'm Nadia Filali. I'm a head of blockchain and crypto asset at uh, Caisse de Depot in France. I think the oldest, oldest company of, of this round table, <laughs> more than 200 years. And um, what I'm thinking about that, we heard a lot about tokenization uh, since the beginning that we are talking about uh, crypto asset and especially I think uh, with Ethereum and the smart contracts. And it's not new. And I think uh, for finance, it could be a real good idea to tokenize financial asset, but not only financial asset. Uh, that we can invest in. And the, 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 the constraint could be more in the regulation space and the real um, um, advantage that can support some in the internet, the risk to don't go there. Because uh, if tokenization could make the system of uh, and the finance infrastructure more efficient, it also have some impact, some, some intermediaries like uh, CSD, for example, if we are in classical securities, it's one point. But I think also that it could help us to uh, uh, make more people going investing in uh, SMEs and to take more risk because you can invest in uh, some small amount and you can approve more liquidity also uh, on that. So I think the future of tokenization, it's concrete, but make them time, take times. Thank you, Nadia, very much for your, um, your answer. Maybe, Sebastian, could, could we have your point of view on, on this question? And maybe can you also add uh, what do you think, uh, what could be the advantages of tokenization? What advantages brings tokenization? Sure, I can. So first of all, um, just a few words to myself. Um, Sebastian, I'm senior product owner at Commerce Bank, responsible for uh, the DLT and blockchain activities driven out of Frankfurt here. Um, we are working in uh, uh, five areas uh, with regards to blockchain, and three of them are also uh, closely related to tokenization. So I'm very happy um, to be here. So for example, um, capital markets, but also um, payments and crypto custody are very relevant um, areas for us. So very excited to be here. So with regards to your question, um, is tokenization uh, here to stay is the big question, of course. And I think, um, let me share three uh, of my observations with you. Um, the first one is that um, the tokenization is getting um, more and more uh, uh, relevant at the moment. If you look at market capitalization of different um, types of digital assets, um, be it uh, cryptocurrencies, but also be it um, tokenized physical assets or be it um, securities which are going to be tokenized. So you just simply cannot ignore them anymore. Um, the second thing is um, all, and that's what, what Nadia also uh, mentioned um, just a few seconds ago, is um, the whole thing about regulation. Regulation is moving very fast here, which will, from my perspective, uh, lead to a certain professionalization. And um, with more um, um, of this um, legal, secure environment, you can offer products and services in a legal, uh, secure way to your clients. Um, more and more players um, will enter into the market, and this will also um, lead to, to, to a further boost here. And last but not least, um, I was just saying uh, more and more players entering into the market. What I see um, at the moment is that uh, more and more incumbents, be it uh, large um, banks or be it also uh, infrastructure providers, are um, starting to accompany um, fintechs and neobanks in this um, area. So um, they are um, entering into the space which will lead to uh, higher competition and higher competition will lead to uh, more product and services and more clients so on and so forth. So I think 
um, what we see at the moment um, is that it is um, indeed um, on a very good way to come and also to stay. Um, with regards to the advantages, and this is of course a major driver of um, why, why uh, everybody is looking into this. Um, so there are different perspectives, I think, with regards to digital um, securities. Um, if we look at capital markets, I think um, the um, hope of being able to do automation and saving costs is, um, is there. Definitely one of the uh, major drivers. And uh, with regards to other assets, and I think um, other guys from the panels uh, do have uh, even deeper insights here. Um, it's more like uh, enabling um, fragmentation uh, uh, to specific types of assets, which was not there, making them more investable and um, enabling more business opportunities. Thank you, Sebastian. Um, maybe Thomas, can you give us your point of view about this question and as well add um, something about According to you, what are the best assets to tokenize? Uh, so do you believe that uh, tokenization is finally here to stay? And if so, uh, according to you, which assets are the best to tokenize, real estate or financial assets, or maybe pieces of hearts? What's your point on, on that? Sure, thank you. Uh, thank you, Adrian. And, and thank you for the, uh, to the organizers of the event for, uh, for having us today. So I'm Thomas, uh, Chief Product Officer at, uh, at Polymath. Uh, Polymath, we're a software company that's that's driven by a vision of a world where everyone has equal access to economic growth. And what we're doing uh, to execute on this vision is automating and simplifying regulated markets through blockchain. So what are the things that uh, Sebastian was saying just a moment ago around automation is uh, is very near and dear to our hearts. And to, uh, to get there, we're, we're contributing to a dependable compliance focused blockchain uh, that can help connect market participants and grow the security token market. Uh, when it comes to, you know, is the tokenization of financial assets there? I would say it, it's actually, it, we have to look back at the definition of what, what we mean by being being here. You know, I think uh, uh, Jay Biancamano from, uh, from State Street described it best by saying, you know, security tokens would come in a trickle, trickle flood. I think we've already seen some tokenization happening, but that was more part of the, of the trickling uh, not yet the flooding. Uh, for the flooding to occur, there's still, uh, there's still a little bit of work to be done. But what's been very interesting is to see the progress, both from an infrastructure and regulation perspective. I'm sure you've all seen the news about uh, seven, eight days ago with the, the former CTO of Chainalysis uh, being named the new interim director of FinCEN. And I think what we can see there is there was already a strong desire from um, regulators to, to support the initiative. Baffin, for example, um, has, uh, um, has made uh, quite, a lot of, uh, quite a lot of work there and so has the FCA. But we're seeing also not only uh, the, the, that desire to better understand what it means as well as a, a strong desire to educate themselves and to staff themselves in a way that they can support um, that flood, uh, when that flood arrives. So, you know, the tokenization of financial assets, is it finally here? Yes, yes, it is. Uh, the infrastructure is continuing to build up to support the flood, but the trickling has certainly begun. And, and when it comes to which assets, I think there's been a lot of experimentation. We've seen a lot of experimentation happening around bonds. We've seen experimentation happening around real estate, around art. Right around uh, uh, private markets as well. Um, in my opinion, where we see the largest potential, where I see the largest potential for those financial assets, in, is the in the augmentation of capital markets, not the replacement of existing rails. Mm -hmm. And so, what I mean by that is, there's a variety of assets that um, uh, organizations wanted to uh, to securitize for a while. And they couldn't because it was just not cost effective or there was no real um, benefit in, in, in doing this. There was, there was no real way to consume any value out of it. With, with tokenization now, what we're seeing is, is certainly a lot of interest in real estate, but a tremendous potential in, um, in fixed income type assets uh, with the automation that can, uh, that can come with it. Um, and what's, what's even more interesting is there's also brand new products that are coming into play or brand new ideas that are coming into play. 
um, where organizations, for instance, come to us and, and say, you know, I'd be looking for technology that allows me to tokenize an asset and deliver this. And, and, and they start describing what they want to accomplish. And, and those are very novel, uh, very, very innovative uh, way uh, of, of looking at um, uh, the secretization of a secretization of assets. So when it comes to the assets that we already know, I would say real estate and fixed income have, have phenomenal potential, but there's also the, the part that we don't know yet because now that we have access to all these tools, now that we have access to that technology, capital markets is not short of ideas. <laughs> so I'm sure there's gonna be brand new products that uh, with respect to everybody on the panel would probably are not thinking about right now, but 12 months from now, we'll look at them and go, well, that was a brilliant idea. Uh, how, do we, uh, how do we get into this? Thank you, Thomas. Dotun, can you please quickly introduce yourself and uh, let us know as well your thoughts about uh, tokenization and the fact it will, uh, it's here to stay? Absolutely. Thank you very much, uh, Hadrian, and thank you, uh, the organizers, for inviting me here. Um, yeah, so, so I'm uh, Dotun. I co steer Emerging Technology and Innovation at the London Stock Exchange Group. Um, much of my focus is, 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 is generally centered around driving the adoption of new technologies like blockchain um, and DLT. And, and really um, looking to scale this for digital assets, uh, namely uh, looking at securities today. Um, but but obviously, you know that 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 spans much further beyond. I mean, I think from a tokenization perspective, I echo all of the sentiments that have been uh, presented so far. I mean, we see uh, across the space uh, in the securities uh, market, there's lots of opportunity. You know, in the private markets around primary markets issuance and automation of a lot of the commercial workflows that in the past have been generally led by large incumbents, namely investment banks, but today through digitization, through tokenization, um, have really brought cost efficiencies um, that, that really enable you know, these services to be offered to new clients, but also for um, you know, newer asset classes, which is very interesting. And then I think beyond, beyond that, when you look further afield, you know, there's lots of, of activity now, really looking at how do we plug the gaps in market infrastructure um, for these digital assets? How do we provide rails that allow them to be uh, ad admitted to, to listing and traded and settled and bilaterally traded in, 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 in private markets too. And, and I think that's really where um, the landscape needs to go. And that's where the hard work is being done around regulation, the regulatory compliance, around technology, infrastructure, robustness and scalability. And I think once you get past that point, we're really going to start to see a snowball effect where innovation really starts to take hold, where and um, you know the, the newer, more innovative fintech can really build on these, these these infrastructures and really layer on new products and services and, and 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 new capabilities that will really benefit the markets. Thank you very much. Uh, last, but, last but not least, Jan, we would be very happy to to have your thoughts about this uh, question as well. And uh, and please feel free to introduce yourself as well. Thank you very much. Um, yes, I think it's very hard to, to now speak after all of you gave your, your great thoughts about it, but I, I will try to, to give my two cents to it. Um, I personally believe that the tokenization of assets is here to stay and actually it has product zeitgeist fit right now. So we are right now in a, of course, crazy time after one year of uh, Corona. And, and what I personally believe is that, that right now we are at the first tipping point of many and exactly like thomas said it right there will be more and more waves of where tokenization of assets actually comes in but if we're looking at this one it's actually driven by a young generation and um, they actually drive the change and we see that things are getting tokenized we didn't thought about the same way two years ago if we're looking now at the the sales volume of crypto punk which is around about 200 million we're looking that Nifty Gateway made uh, 75 million revenue in February and 100 million in March. These are things that, that none of us, I, I would not have betted on that, right? And what we're seeing there is that actually new products, completely new products are opening up that market and therefore then will influence uh, the old products um, that, that are then changing over time because people are getting used to it. And that's actually quite a common way, right? How the internet and, and all of these things worked over time. And I think that's, that's what's super exciting about it. I think we are far, like we still have some way to go until it touches the complete old world and old products. But we're seeing that a generational change is happening. And therefore, this, these are the new investors for the next 20 to 30 years. And I think that's that's super interesting and in a, in a very exciting time, right? It's a kind of um, 
the next Web 3.0 situation where we are actually maybe hitting a climax. And um, of course, for us, I have to say I'm biased. Yeah, I'm, we are running a, a startup called Timeless. Uh, we are fractionalizing rare collectibles like sneakers, watches, and cars, uh, and uh, other kind of blue chip NFTs. Um, we're based in Berlin, and we actually see a lot of traction of people actually wanting to buy shares of these assets that they could not uh, afford before or could not actually invest into. And um, so my gut feeling there is, I think um, it's the first wave, like Thomas said, and it's a completely different one that a lot of people expected, but that also makes it very good. This gives it the zeitgeist, this drives people to actually care about it and, and therefore then influence big industries like the financial asset industry of all this, right? Very well, thank you very much. Before jumping to the next topic, anyone would like to add something regarding this, uh, this question? All right. So, uh, well, it seems clear that tokenization is here to stay. However, um, and I think it's a good transition uh, with you, Jan. Uh, I believe some aspects need to be uh, explored. For instance, uh, the following one, should we use private blockchain to tokenize assets or should we use public blockchains? What is your opinion regarding this question? Uh, maybe Dotun, what, what's, uh, what's your, your, um, your opinion on this? Should we use private or public blockchain to tokenize assets? You, you want me to go first or you want to go first? Please go, go ahead. Okay. Um, I mean, I would say um, it, it's an interesting one. I, th I think over the course of time, we'll see the realization of both. I think, um, you know, clearly there's a lot of activity going on in the space at the moment in, 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 in leveraging public blockchain. I think the challenge is for very large and, and generally regulated institutions, it's very difficult to engage with a, with a public ledger. Obviously, we've seen, you know, pr proof of values and proof of concepts that have been done in the past. Um, leveraging the technology, but you know, when when you you're making considerations in, as an institution in in that vein around taking a, a product into production, um, you know, there are lots of considerations that one needs to consider, and even from a regulatory standpoint, um, there's an obligation for a regulated institution to have a, a very clear understanding of who they're facing off to commercially when they engage in any kind of deal or execution. And I think that makes it very difficult from a from a, a pseudonymous, pseudonymous public ledger perspective in order to, to concretely um, uh, fulfill your obligations in that respect. And so I, I think what we will see is, you know, growth and maturity of private networks probably managed and operated by either market-led consortia consortiums or by um, large-scale FMIs. And then building on from that, we'll see interoperability and connectivity into public le ledgers where you'll have assets that have much more mobility and, and allow for much more uh, innovation in terms of service provision that, that's built off, built, built off the back of that. Very clear, very clear. Thank you very much. Yeah, and you just mentioned that you are, you are running a startup uh, within the tokenization industry. Um, my question is the same, but I, I would like to add something. If you tokenize an asset on a public blockchain and there is a hard fork, Mm. Um, how do you handle such a risk? And uh, I'm very curious to, to hear you about this uh, because, as you mentioned, you are running a tokenization uh, project. Mm. Yeah, I think, first of all, um, the way of like, how do you decide if you go private or public or in, in between? I think there overall is a very clear way. It will all lead towards interoperability and it has to, right? If, you, if you're actually mm -hmm. closing something, and it cannot float, then it doesn't make a lot of sense. That's the one thing. And I think that's, that's what we were all kind of waiting for, right? So uh, all of us most probably are in this, <laughs> in this industry for quite some years, and, and we are all talking about these different things. And then it has to be always evaluated from a standpoint, what makes sense right now, what is for us, for example, we have uh, end consumers, right? What is the communication way that they understand? And so I think it's, a, it's, a, it's a not an easy question to answer. I know for us, it's quite clear we... Uh, uh, our investors is EOS VC fund. So that actually, of course, then shows the, the, the main net that we're pushing that on. And um, also, therefore, of course, we leave us um, some, some options in the future to see where it actually will evolve yeah, over all the, the whole discussion. And then, of course, let's say, for example, the different risks that are associated. This is one of the beauties I like about this, but also one of the crazy things, right? So 
no one is really sure what will happen. So there is, if, if we as a startup try now to make a, let's say, risk assessment on all of these different things, I would not concentrate on marketing, finding great assets, getting users on and so on and so forth. So yes, we're thinking about this, but it's kind of like um, we put this on our list. We make first assumptions. We then see how we can kind of do it the best way right now and then also put it high on the agenda if it actually seems to be... Uh, something that's happening and that's causing a problem yeah and and overall i think right the the more the more you try to build a transparent clear um product and that's also implemented into the smart contracts and also in the way of how you communicate but also build um everything around fast nfts and the easier i think it will be to actually face uh certain challenges and then actually uh, find the right solutions for it uh without and that's the problem, right? Um, causing problems for your users, because that's what it will end up with. It will end up with with a community or users that are not happy. And um, yeah, that's that's the way how we approach it as a young startup. But most probably, uh, Sebastian can say something from an institutional point of view towards these parts. No, I, I think everything that, that you are saying um, is, is, is completely right. I was thinking when Hadrian was asking um, this question, how to how to structure it and what what are the inputs into the function if a public or a private uh, blockchain um, um, would be suitable and for me um, there are there are two different um, things to 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 look into or to, to put into this function the first one is um, for me always um, the um, the type of asset we are talking about and the second one is the time so how it is evolving and um, my my perspective my two cents on this are. Um, if you if you think um, uh, of the different uh, uh, assets which we see at the moment, cryptocurrencies, um, all this stuff is of course staying on public chains because um, they are born there, um, ecosystems evolve, there will nothing change. Um, with regards to electronic um, securities, I assume there will be a um, shift uh, from public. So when I say securities, I mean uh, like like bonds, equities, so and so forth. I assume there will be a shift more towards um, permission blockchains. Um, why do I think so? Because I see um, large infrastructure providers already building um, solutions there and they tend to like more permission chains because they think that it's better for scalability, um, better for data privacy, um, transaction finality, and also, and this is um, a very important thing, um, the flexibility and the governance which they can put upon it. Um, so this is this is on the on the second end. Um, so this will from 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 more public to more um, will be, will go from more public to more permissioned, I think. And then last but not least, if you think about um, all all the um, tokenized physical goods like art, like like real estate, so on and so forth, um, I think that um, this is going to be more on, but not solely on public blockchains because this is this is what i see at the moment what is happening and and, and small ecosystems are already evolving there um nevertheless um tokenization of physical assets i'm still not sure where this is going to be in the end okay thank you very yeah, much just to, sorry so please go ahead. sorry i just I just wanted to add something to what uh, what sebastian was saying because you know, i think we talk about public we talk about uh, private uh, the um the hybrid uh, approach of a public permission blockchain is actually one that you know we've we, we've considered and and decided to uh, to embark on. You know, you cited the the issue of the the contentious fork and how that could create a duplication of assets. That's that's a real issue. There's ways to solve this, but I think the bigger problem points back to something Dotun mentioned, which is as a regulated entity, you need to understand who is involved in that transaction. And when we talk about a blockchain, that goes all the way down to who the, 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 the block producers are, who the miners, the node operators, however you want to call it, but who takes your transactions, puts it in the block and, and deploys it. And so um, the approach that, that we thought uh, would, be, would be best, and that was you know, after engaging with a, with a variety of, uh, of large banks and like large institutions was to go and use a public permissioned blockchain because the public side of it gives you that transparency that is still a very valuable part of part of blockchain the permissioning addresses the issue of understanding who the who the counterparties and who the participants are in that transaction and what's what's interesting with that approach as well is as regulation evolves so if 
a number of years from now, regulators and banks are comfortable with not knowing who they are paying a transaction fee to, then that identity, that, that identity requirement for every participant on the chain can be removed. We believe that it's easier to relax those requirements than it is to take a system that was built for pseudonymity, that was built for anonymous transactions and just shoehorn capital markets into this saying, we're gonna add all these different pieces that will kind of make it work, but you're still not gonna have any visibility until it's too late, until you've paid that transaction fee as to who participated. And you know, th th there, was a, there was another approach that could be considered, which is to sort of segment the chain and say, there's gonna be a subset of the block producers that are known and identified but then now you have to look back to what Sebastian was saying around considering every type of asset is now you're making this as part of the requirements or the properties of this asset, which means that the risk, uh, the risks are going to change based on what asset type you're talking about, because you may have a different subset of block producers that are involved. That subset may be tiny, which then could be uh, could make an asset subject to potential blockchain manipulation uh, to sort of make a difference from market manipulation. Yes, and if I, if I can go on, uh, I think for my part, there is many answers that have been done and I agree with, but I think for the moment, uh, all is not really clear. And uh, for our perspective, we decide to be a little bit agnostic on the subject. We understand the point of uh, that it's really important for a company like us or financial uh, uh, companies to uh, uh, answer to the, the problematics of compliance, governance and cybersecurity. I think it's really important to be sure of uh, who is uh, playing your blockchain, who is going to put the transaction on. I'm, uh, I'm really uh, agree with that, but also that in the beginning, I think all of us in the, in the big uh, banks or financial infrastructure, we began by POCs on uh, sometimes public and sometimes really private blockchain with one node, uh, things like this. And I agree with Thomas that there is some, there is a way in the middle because playing with only private blockchain with one or some nodes is not really uh, working with blockchain because you need transparency, you need uh, more uh, uh, velocity and you need some decentralization. Uh, playing with public blockchain and the first of them like uh, Bitcoin or Ethereum, sometimes it's really uh, difficult in companies like us because we don't know who manage that and uh, we can have some uh, fear about that. But I think slowly uh, we will go on uh, public permission and blockchain. And it's important uh, in the, this time to work with everyone and to try to uh, find a way to make some different opportunities uh, and technology be interoperable. Because in the beginning, all uh, will be not mature and defined. And it's in that way that we are working uh, now. For example, we are working on, the, on commercial interbank uh, currency uh, related to settlement on security. And we decide to work on uh, different blockchain, public and, and private on that subject, and to try to make them working together and to try to permit uh, entities that could be um, investor, for example, to, uh, to choose where they want to work. Because if you are looking to the market, there is different actors uh, who develop uh, asset for uh, tokenization or infrastructure. They are not all playing on uh, private on or public, and they are, some of them, all uh, really interesting. So we need to 
to try to understand how we can work, how we can also uh, securize of some uh, some uh, point of on regulation and how we can also innovate on that because, for example, if you are talking about uh, property of asset and if you are in Europe or in France, you will not have the same definition who is the, the real uh, property, uh, who have the property of the asset and where is the transfer of value. And if we are working on a blockchain, the, the, the property of the, the asset is not in France, in Germany, in the United States or, or in UK. And it's a real, real um, subject to um, identify where we want to go and how we will manage that because it seems like really simple but if we are talking about who had the, the asset in the, the register where is the register if you are even in a permission uh, a public permission blockchain you are not only in one country on, or one area so it's one of the points but uh, I think uh, it's what is really excited to don't know where we go exactly for the moment. Just quickly, maybe can I, I speak directly to this? Uh, as I think it's very interesting, Nadia, as you said, your company is 200 years old, ours is two years old, so we are exactly the opposite, but the problems are the same, right? <laughs> yes. It's the point of this, so much is not clear to a certain aspect, and, and that they, they're, of course, you look at all of these different options, regulatory, I'm fighting is the wrong word, but I'm in deep discussions with the BaFin now for quite some time with our startup and everything else and trying to figure out. And of course, they don't have all the answers for certain things. But we as a startup, we need answers. And then also we have the next aspect is like, okay, what's going to happen on the protocol level? And then for a startup, this of course means let's just do it and let's drive traction because waiting is not an option because then we're running out of money. But then of course, for you with a company that's 200 years old, that's excellent. Um, exactly not the option just to try it out and then later find out what it is but what what the situation I think shows on the one side very big opportunity on a lot of different levels but an unbelievable amount of uncertainty where you actually cannot you just have to do educated guesses I think mm -hmm. a lot of times and then you have to say okay if this actually pops up then we have to find a way but before it before it's not really like blowing into our face we have to concentrate on the rest. And I think that's uh, a very complex thing and I'm, I'm not happy, but it seems like you as a 200 year old organization have the same problem as we as a two year old startup. Yeah. But I think the, the paradox here is that we are all talking about technology and we are all talking to how regulate the technology. But in the fact before, you never decide what technology you use to, to work with your securities. You never talk about technology. And because the technology is coming from crypto assets and from crypto sphere in the beginning, everyone go on the regulation on technology. And the subject is not regulation of technology, but how you use your security, your market, and what are the transactions between the people, how you can manage your KYC between the client and the invest, the, the banks or the clients and the investors. And it's a real paradox here that it's difficult to manage. And I think we need to find a way to work together, startups, corporate and regulator to more understand the, the point that we have to, uh, to explore and to debate on to find a way to work. Because for the moment, we are sometimes turning around the points. And, Many things work technically, but the regulation and the technology are not working together as well, I think. Sorry, Adrian, I go no, 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 on the question. Very, but... <laughs> very interesting. And maybe I would like to add something because we all know, uh, understand the, the problem of having a, a transaction fee paid to a validator. We don't know on the public blockchain, but just to give an example to people listening to us, let's imagine we have a commerce bank with uh, Sebastian issuing um, a, a, a financial asset such as a bond mm -hmm. under the form of a security token and sell it, selling it to uh, Caisse de Depot, to Nadia. Mm -hmm. 
Sebastian will do a transaction on the network, on the, mm -hmm. on the public blockchain network, and will be ending paying a transaction fee to a, a, a validator, a miner on Ethereum mm -hmm. or a, a baker on Tezos, mm -hmm. to pay the, the, the validator that will include the transaction in the block that has been produced. And what about this baker or miner uh, being in North Korea, for instance? I understand that this could be a, a problem. I just wanted to explain that so for people not uh, uh, as much uh, familiar as we are with uh, this, uh, this problematic. And this is a point you addressed uh, just uh, earlier, Thomas. So mm -hmm. I, I understand your point and maybe, yes, uh, I don't know if, if it's the solution to a public or private or public permission, let's see. Um, talking about reg re regulation and legislation, maybe we can uh, jump to uh, uh, another topic uh, regarding uh, the way uh, we can perform deliver versus payment operation for a security token. And I'd like now to discuss the, the CBDC topic and uh, its relation to tokenization. We all know that many central banks are currently performing experiments on central bank digital currency, CBDC. And my question is, uh, do you believe that having a CBDC uh, in a country could be useful for the tokenization industry? Uh, for instance, if it could be useful because you could, for instance, perform a 100 on-chain deliver versus payment operation, having the security leg and the cash leg on the blockchain. And maybe, um, I'd like to have your point on that, Dotun and, and Sebastian and Nadia as well after. I know you are uh, running a, an experiment on a very similar topic with digital uh, currency for interbank settlement. Maybe Dotun, you can, what do you think uh, uh, of, this, uh, of this question? I think Dotun is not anymore with us. So Sebastian, please, the floor is yours. Ah, okay, perfect. So a few minutes more for me. Um, no, I think I think um, all the tokenization in capital markets is around, as I already said, automation, cost optimization, so on and so forth. And um, thinking about the cash lag here, I think uh, that you definitely need a cash lag there to unleash the full potential. So that's for me 100% um, clear. Um, do I need a CBDC for this? Well, I think um, a CBDC for interactions between, so the settlement interactions between um, banks could be of help there. It could be either issued uh, directly by a central bank or it could be something um, which is at least um, of the quality of central bank money. So um, somehow backed by um, central bank money. At the same time, I think that we also um, have to consider um, things like commercial bank money as we have it today, but in a tokenized form for use cases where you do not necessarily mean, uh, uh, need to take um, um, central bank cash. Um, uh, we, we did a couple of experimentations here, um, I think uh, last year and the year before, and we were issuing something um, um, for an ECP issuance, which we did um, based on the e-money regulation. Um, so we issued e-money on Ledger, which is uh, good to uh, be used in a closed circle but what we need is a more um, fungible, interchangeable um, thing, which we can, um, um, which our customers also can can uh, uh, change amongst each other, uh, while there are uh, customers at different banks. So I think um, with with central bank money, you always have um, risks of disintermediation, um, refinancing issues that could potentially arise at uh, banks, um, risks of a, a a going down credit supply, so on and so forth, um, and. My perspective is um, that we uh, definitely need to also let space for um, commercial banks to provide an innovative solution there. But nevertheless, um, the thing is, I think we need something, a cash lag um, to, to unleash the potential. In the meantime, until uh, all these um, things are there, um, there are also some um, more or less smart um, solutions being developed um, who are uh, connecting blockchain business networks which, uh, um, uh, with, with uh, established payment systems, for example. So Bundesbank ran a um, pilot there. Um, they were having a security transactions which triggered the payments in central bank cash um, on the target system. And um, I think um, in the meantime, until we have these uh, cash on ledger and the way we need it, 
we should also think about um, trigger solutions which could help us in the meantime as a bridge technology. Thank you very much. I think many people want to intervene. M maybe Dotun. Dotun, come back. Yeah. Apologies, I got disconnected. Um, I mean, yeah, I would echo pretty much everything that Sebastian said. I mean, we're actually exploring this um, fairly extensively. So we have a project um, in the FCA's Innovation Sandbox looking at um, post-trade settlement to digital securities and namely UK equities. And it's interesting, um, we, we, we haven't yet uh, explored this in the context of the CBDC, but we projected that something like a CBDC would exist at some stage in the future. And what's interesting is, you know, when you look at uh, public markets, um, because the function of settlement is essentially centralized, um, essentially through the role of a CSD, then it does give you, give you some optionality. So um, as Sebastian said, either you have a CBDC that is issued by the central bank and then uh, you, can, you can leverage that to perform um, atomic settlements on chain, or you can provide essentially a mechanism that proxies the cash leg or just um, settle the uh, securities leg on the ledger and essentially provide an integration to an off-chain uh, existing uh, uh, cash payment system, cash settlement system essentially, um, that would allow you to run DVP through almost like two atomic settlements on two separate subsystems. Mm -hmm. So there are mechanisms to enable that. Um, I think what's interesting um, again is you know there are lots of lots of opportunities to leverage uh, M1 money or commercial bank money in in a tokenized form, and we're seeing projects across the ecosystem exploring use cases, whether that be through around into bank payments, and um, whether that be through trade finance and other 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 opportunities there. And I think when you look at solutions like uh, Finality pushing for building you know tokenized FX markets for wholesale fi uh, financial settlement. And the, the, again, there are you know there, there are lots of um, use cases where we see you know a clear value of commercial bank money on, on the ledger. But I think CBDC is interesting in the context of providing essentially direct access to risk-free uh, cash, um, which has very strong implications in terms of some of the services that CSDs provide today and enabling them to bring them onto the ledger and um, for digital securities um, in in the context of public of, of public markets. But then similarly, you know there are other other use cases where CBDCs may find a lot of value. Um, in the in the retail retail and um, financial market side, so we'll see how that evolves. Yes, if I can, Adrian, I, I uh, totally people. agree with what uh, said Sebastian and, and Dutun because uh, um, really uh, we work on tokenization of asset now from 2016. Uh, we launched uh, Liquid Share with different banks and. Uh, CSD and the uh, French uh, 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 next uh, bourse and we know that it works but always we have a work that we said in France where is la pat cash so <laughs> how we work with the cash leg and uh, we work in the beginning in uh, in lab chain on the POC on the, uh, something like uh, euro token and looking about stable coins and now we are working with um, two banks, PNP and Credit Agricole, and, and two providers that Tokeny and uh, the blockchain XDEV on that, because we think that it could be really a solution to go ahead on the how to work on settlement on security. And, uh, and that could be also interesting to work on that with the discussion that there is on the different regulatory or central banks now, because the, the fact that perhaps uh, we will have a digital euro or a USD a token or something else uh, will happen, but we will not do transaction directly with the, the central bank money. We will have some question of how about the intermediaries, how about the banks, and how it could work uh, in an interbank perspective. So I think it's important to go on the subject. Uh, for the moment, it's, I don't know, in, in the in UK or in Germany, but in France, it's a little bit new because we heard a lot about the, the really good, really good uh, initiative of, of the Bank de France. But uh, for the moment, we don't heard a lot about uh, the commercial initiative. You can hear about private initiative like, like DM and Central Bank. And between that, you don't heard many things. But if you are looking what happened in, I think in USA with the authorization of the controller to, for the banks to use stablecoin and what happened in China 
with the central bank and other commercial bank from the, the area of Korea, China, and Japan. It's interesting to see that the, tr the things are moving. And I think perhaps we could have go more quickly on this, this subject than on securities and could uh, have a solution to develop the, the things on, on the other asset after, on securities and others. And I, I agree that uh, also it's securized uh, from where it's coming the cash, because if you are looking for the transaction in some public blockchain, we have all, always the subject of compliance and stability of, uh, of the, the cash link. I think maybe just sorry, just to add one more point uh, to, to, to Nadia's uh, point, and also in the context of DVP specifically and settlement mm -hmm. finality, um, it's it's very interesting, and it kind of segues back into the question of public versus private ledgers too. When when we look at that, um, because it's very difficult in the context of let's say for example a public ledger to enable um, uh, uh, settlement finality, which in, in essence is a legal construct where you have essentially probabilistic consensus. Um, because if you, if, you, if you don't have a clear pitch of where your transaction finality has occurred, then it becomes very, very tricky to determine, you know, at what point can you say or can a regulator say um, that, yeah, settlement finality has occurred and therefore, you know, the relevant protections um, that, 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 are, that are offered by that and can be passed, passed along. Yeah, I, I, agree, I, agree I agree with... with Yes. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> I, sorry, I will let you after, but I agree. And, and it's why uh, now we are working on different technology and we are sure um, that the issuer of the, the cash have to be really involved if what on one it's done and have to be responsible of the governance of the cash. You cannot let something that you don't know <laughs> be the, the, the leader of the governance of that. And today it's one of the, the key points if you are working on public chain, I think. So we are looking at that one, but I think Thomas wants to react. So, so. Yeah, I mean, just on, on the points Dotun, Dotun was making regarding you know, uh, probabilistic finality versus deterministic finality. And, and, and I think, you know, it points back to uh, I believe I saw a comment uh, that uh, a member of the audience made around, you know, let's consider the asset and determine based on that asset where it should be deployed, if it should be on a public chain or a private chain, and if so, which one. And I think ultimately all this points to the criticality of interoperability between blockchains, because where a CBDC may be, may not be where a security token maybe uh, for for a variety of uh, for a, a variety of reasons but for a transaction to occur there's going to th there's going to need to be a securities leg and a cash leg and how do we make sure from a settlement perspective that that operation can be conducted as automated in an in an automatic way in an atomic way um, while reducing or, or uh, protecting, basically, reducing the risk for, uh, for, for counterparties. And so the, the finality, I think, applies to both uh, on the security side and on the cash side. Um, and, and that's something that you know, we, we've, we've certainly uh, looked into quite extensively, and that has driven a lot of the designs on, on, on the work that, um, that we've done. Um, but the, uh, the interoperability in the end is has to be a priority for anyone that's working in blockchain. And, and I mean, to, to take an example for us, the approach that we took was to build that ability to perform interoperability directly within the settlement engine of the chain. So that, that, that way you can have tokenized cash on that chain, or you can have tokenized cash on another chain, or you can use regular rails. You can use Swift if you want to, uh, to uh, to perform that transaction because cash legs and securities leg are going to move at different speed from a technology adoption perspective, given the different set of requirements from a um, anti money laundering to control of uh, monetary policies and everything in the middle, and so uh, that to me that all points to that the criticality of having a solution that's interoperable. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Um, 
let's discuss one last topic before taking the, the question from the audience. And I can see that there are a lot of questions. Uh, well, we all have seen, um, or we all have been witnesses of uh, the success of non-fungible tokens uh, recently. And um, in a certain way, it's a kind of tokenization of assets as well. So my question is, how do you link NFTs, non-fungible tokens, and the tokenization industry? Maybe, Jan, you can enlighten us uh, on these points. Um, yeah, so I think of all what we're seeing right now in NFTs, right, is a crazy way of how the last three months went with people. Now with PAC uh, do, uh, launching with Sotheby's, we already have kind of a little bit of a decline in this whole industry. Um, but overall, what, what I personally think, right, there's a very big movement towards these things, but also what we can see is that it's not the traditional things that get tokenized or get uh, become an NFT to a certain aspect, but rather um, the way that completely new ways uh, are looked into. So before we had the part of real estate, uh, it gets tokenized. There are a lot of startups raising huge amounts of money on the whole part of real estate. The problem that I personally most probably see in that case, you have a lot of very well-established companies who do real estate investments for, let's say, the last... 50 years, they have really big teams, they have a lot of access to cash. Their real advantage to move everything of this towards the blockchain and tokenize it and make it available for everyone is not that big compared to other parts and other verticals where you don't have that kind of professional companies in the background and on the other side and uh, don't have, uh, let's say, uh, really big companies who have a legacy of 50 years in doing that. For us, that means, for of course, if I'm buying a specific old time, I'm buying a specific watch, I'm competing with most probably a really rich guy who tries to do that. And I'm trying to offer it to my community. So this gives us, of course, leverage and therefore, of course, the adoption in these cases and why people actually want to do it because we actually get assets that are really good, right? If we're seeing like, if you want to buy a, house on the Champs-Élysées, or let's say a flat, there's actually no chance most probably that you're getting access to that deal because uh, there are a lot of big companies are already buying that. Um, and so, so coming back to the question, what, what, do we, what do we see right now in that market and, and what is happening? We actually see again an adoption in a not natural kind of industries. We see it with nifty gateways. We see it with people, right? 69 million um, paid in ether by someone who owns a lot of uh, um, people, other kind of uh, artworks. Um, but now he's actually, I think, in the top five of uh, the living artists and souls artworks. So it, it's madness in it all. I think there will be a lot of um, uh, new concepts coming up and then slowly the old world will follow up on that. And, and uh, what we have to see, whereas an adverse... Um, um, selection in a certain way where do you have big players in the industry that don't have any interest to to introduce blockchain they say we are really happy that no one really understands how our business works we do this while inviting you to a big steak and uh, and a nice red wine and that's why you are selling to my family office the house on the champs Elysees. and i think this this is where this whole way is going but also that's why we see the adoption so strong that we have Companies that have not been on any radar for uh, three years ago that are now making 100 million euros in revenue. We have an artist who did uh, uh, yeah, art over 13 years and now is one of the most successful artists that we have here. And we have complete new ways of how artists can actually make money with royalties, but this can be so easily um, connected into brand owners, into all different other kind of aspects in the business. So. Yeah, that's 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 my take on on what will happen there, and that again we have a completely different approach how society uh, went towards that trend. But the same way how how it was with Bitcoin, right? And Ethereum, these were not the big banks who backed it, right? So they're slowly now coming towards that. Sorry for that, Sebastian, but um, I think also it's a generational move. It's it's a new group of investors that are believing into certain things, like for example that a digital art piece has a lot of value. And that's what we're going towards. And it's just a small beginning of an overall tokenization of assets. And I ultimately believe everything will be tokenized. And then most probably it's down the road of 10 years, but then, um, and this can actually make it to everyone accessible. 
However, and that's the last point, I think there's still a lot of players in the industries who are not interested that a lot of things are accessible. And so we have to look at the industries where it is and then actually provide the normal people the possibility to invest in these things. Thank you very much. And Nadia, you want to add something? I think the subject of NFT is not new, really. And uh, with my team, we develop uh, something that could work with the NFT five years ago. <laughs> so I think it's not new. And the, the real point is to see where it could be really interesting for the users and what will happen. Because if you can buy a flat in Champs-Élysées by 1,000 people, okay. But if you don't have any use of that, it could be only by waiting that the price of your flat in Champs-Élysées will increase and that everyone wants to sell it in the same time. And it could be difficult. And this exists already. Many people uh, buy flat in Marbella, for example, <laughs> or in the Spain uh, coast. And uh, it was not really uh, working. It's the situation that we see. So I think for real estate, it's not really new, this, this kind of things. But um, I think it's more interesting for art, for example, um, or some really rare um, uh, objects. And perhaps it will have something like a game for, um, uh, I don't know if you know about Sandbox, for example, in, uh, in Asia, but perhaps there is something around the, the game industry. And uh, perhaps also it will have something about uh, how you can uh, tokenize some uh, uh, IP of uh, object or R, for example, I. I design a chair and I want that chair could uh, be uh, reproducing anywhere, but I will share a part of the IP with, with others. I, I think it could be a good idea, mm. but I'm not sure in uh, real estate that it will continue. A real estate token is, in real estate, it's like um, uh, what you are doing now with securities and phones on real estate. It's my uh, one quick thing, and then I'm uh, happy to give it to Sebastian. And I think at that point, right, there are so many concepts that all of us heard that we all like that we, we hear for five years now. And I personally believe follow the adoption, not follow the money, but follow the adoption. Where do mm -hmm. we actually have people who care and, and, and put down with their wallet in the end a sign that they do it? Because there, there are so many things that we all know that is there yeah from let's say decentralized autonomous organizations it's a crazy good concept there's not so big adoption but it will come so and i think right now we have the first big wave of adoption at certain points and a lot of others will follow no happy to give it to sebastian no no not not really having uh, to add something to to what you and uh, nadia said um knowing that i come from from a commercial bank um Being since 150 years, I might have a little um, less, uh, or no, how, how to say in English, um, um, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit uh, more traditional um, with my perspectives. But everything you said, um, and also what, what Nadia said, is com completely right. So nothing to add. I think. Your mute. micro. You're mute. Sorry, uh, so I think just to pick up on some of Nadia's points, I mean, so prior to, to my time uh, at the LSUG, I actually uh, co-founded uh, a, a startup and we were looking to build, and um, this is probably about three years ago now, uh, a solution for uh, digitizing and tokenizing video game assets. And we were looking at non-fungible tokens and fungible tokens. I, th I think what was in what's interesting when we see kind of the modern wave of, um, of, of NFTs is that... Um, You know, obviously, there's a lot of there's a lot of interest, there's a lot of a lot of growth, and a lot of um, you know nascent activity there and innovation. It's very very interesting. But I think, I um, you know, through some of the analyses that we did in the past, it's it's very interesting when you explore some of the the fairly open questions around structurally. You know, what what makes a good asset? What what what, ma what makes a good asset for tokenization? Whether the, whether that be as you know in the form of an NFT or or in the form of a fungible token, um, or otherwise. And I think that you know it comes down to questions of You know, if it's if it's a physical asset that you're that you're tokenizing, and um, 
you know, what's the core utility of that, that asset? How is that utility consumed? And is there, an, is there a way to build an inherent link uh, with that physical asset and the token, whether that be through a mobilization or some other, other mechanism? And if it's a, an intangible asset, um, is, it, is, it, is it a bearer construct or a non-bearer construct? And I think there are questions around, you know, if it's a bearer construct, it makes it relatively trivial. If it's a, if it's a non-bearer construct, construct, such as a security, let's say, you know, a, a deed around a, 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 a physical asset, is there a legal register that exists today already that's apart from the blockchain that dictates um, essentially ownership. And so th there are lots of interesting questions around that. Um, you know, the, the digital art is a very interesting one for me, having a technology background. Um, digital um, assets that are not tokenized generally don't maintain the property of economic rival rivalry. So trying to tokenize them, it makes it very difficult because there's no inherent link between the two. So there's still lots of open questions around, you know, what is the ownership structure? How does it actually work? And where is the, where is the true value in these things? And I think a lot of that will, 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 will be explored more in, and uncovered over time. And quickly, quickly also um, mentioning on that, I think one of the, the biggest things right now, if we're looking in the industry, there's there's a huge bubble coming, right? So we're, we're in the end, ultimately with NFTs in uh, ICO 2.0, 97%, most probably of the NFTs will not hold their value. We, we and, then, and then the question will be, what, what actually has real value? The same way, like you're saying, right? Is it connected? Is it just digital? Is it connected to real security? Does it have a real use case? Let's look at so rare, yeah? Where in the end, they actually made NFTs that are now usable in their game and so on and so forth. But we can already see also there that there's a huge adoption of people towards that kind of combination of gamification and to certain financial aspects and collectible aspects. Um, but it, does this look like a bubble? Holy shit, yes. Yeah, that's a that's a really, really crazy thing. And then the question again is what what are blue chips, right? CryptoPunks actually launched before there was a kind of the the the, the NFT standard ERC721 uh, on, on Ethereum, but they rather had that idea of, of how would we do that and then very strongly, I think, influenced that. And um, therefore it's a crazy situation on the one side, but also like you're saying, right? Uh, if we seeing what, what comes with games, what comes with other collectibles, there, there are a lot of people working on it. And um, the problem that, that money is programmed into the overall idea, of course, will lead to, let's say, a lot of sad faces, most probably in six months down the road. But ultimately, it will stay the same thing like ICO state, right? There were a few really, really successful, really great companies that had a lot of ideas um, uh, or actually a very good white paper and then actually delivered on that. But there were most probably also a lot of scammers who just ran away. Yeah? So maybe maybe uh, let me add one thought here. The, the one thing I'm, I'm a little bit um, worried about is indeed, and this is related to what you are just saying, um, when I think back um, to the year 2017, uh, 2018, um, is the whole NFT uh, discussion something which is going to push the blockchain discussion and the distributed network discussions again? Or will it be the next thing which is uh, bursting and um, throw me back three years or four years um, uh, again? making me um, need to, uh, to uh, describe and to explain everybody that blockchain is not a, 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 a very, very bad thing for everybody. Yeah? So there's a little, little thing which is worrying me uh, about the whole NFT discussion. Thomas. No, I was going to say to, uh, to Sebastian's point, I think you know, when, when we say NFT, we, we perhaps are a little too focused on the technology and not enough on what the asset what's the asset that's underneath it. And from a regulator's perspective, it's gonna be a matter of fact and circumstances. If that asset is a security, NFT or not, it's a security and it's gonna to have to be subject to transfer restrictions and KYC and, and, and all of these things. So that I, I do share to some, to some extent Sebastian's concern as well. All right. All right. To... To continue, I propose we take some questions from the audience and let me find one. Actually, while you do that, I just wanted to answer to one that, yeah, that sure. popped up regarding, uh, so there was a there was a, a question or, or a comment uh, based on CBDCs on SWIFT. And I think uh, perhaps I, I, uh, I wasn't, wasn't clear when I talked about interoperability. So when I mentioned SWIFT, it was in the context of interoperability between the securities being be within um, being on a on a blockchain, 
and the cash leg potentially being settled on, on SWIFT, not about putting CBDCs on SWIFT, because as it is very clearly described in the comment, it would be, uh, and I'll, I'll paraphrase, it will be like giving someone a Microsoft Excel spreadsheet and asking them to calculate the cells with the calculator. So it was strictly in the context of, uh, of interoperability that I, was, uh, that I was talking about SWIFT, not about putting CBDCs on SWIFT at all. But just one general question regarding um, regulations. We have a question um, and I mean, yeah. How long do you think it will take for regulators to accept tokenization in contract transactions, for instance, for real estate? I think it's a difficult question because regulation are not the same in all places of the world, but Anyone would like to, to jump into this question? We don't know. No. <laughs> it's depend yeah, I think it's, uh, it's depend on, on what we are talking. If we are talking about securities, I think uh, we know that it's in Europe something about MIFID and, uh, and the sandbox of uh, that uh, it's now uh, gone on the on Europe, uh, if you are talking about crypto, uh, you are talking about Mika. So it's about, about what you are talking about and what are the, the what it seems like. It's a, it is a financial asset or not. I think it's not only about smart contract. Smart contract is not a contract, it's a code. And I think it's really stay the code. And if you do the link with IA, for example, and the question about who is responsible, the machine, the algorithm, or the people who is the issuer, we will have the same question here. So, mm -hmm. I don't know. Another question. Uh, any comments about the tokenization and regulation of charity donations? Anyone would like to take this one? Tokenization of charity donations. Maybe, may I, I have a question for you, Sebastian. Um, we, we are seeing more and more um, commercial banks. Maybe it's a question coming a little bit more than to traditional tokenization with financial assets, but we see more and more commercial banks issuing assets uh, using smart contracts. Do you believe that um, the, uh, the, the the fact that commercial banks are using uh, smart contracts to issue financial assets such as bonds or uh, options or I don't know, is motivated by cost reduction or by mo e efficiency in, in the way the assets is, uh, is issued? I, I think what you what you say is completely right. When I think about uh, using um, smart contracts and whatever assets are to be issued or handled along the life cycle, along the uh, value chain which we which we have in the capital markets, um, it's it's uh, mostly driven by uh, uh, the ability to somehow uh, reduce costs, be it in reconciliation, be it for corporate actions, um, be it for uh, cash handling, so on and so forth. So um, I think from from that perspective, indeed, um, especially with regards to capital markets and um, everything which you see there, especially in the post trading um, area, uh, I think it's all or mostly driven by uh, by costs and smart contracts are the vehicle to uh, enable automation and the cost reduction there. So my next next question related to that is, it seems to be clear that uh, it's very cost effective and it's a, a huge, it could be a huge cost reduction to automatize the issuance of uh, financial assets uh, by using a blockchain, it can be a private, a public or a public permission one. My question is, um, in Europe, at least, um, we don't have yet a secondary market regulated to, um, to trade uh, security tokens. Uh, what, what is your opinion on that? Do you believe that the fact that more and more commercial banks will issue financial assets uh, using blockchain will push the development of regulated secondary markets? Or do you think that uh, because we don't have a 
secondary regulated market for security token, uh, the adoption of the tokenization uh, will be very difficult. And it's an open question to, to, to all of you, and maybe Dotun, and <clears throat> please feel free to answer. Yeah, and, and I think to chime in here as a, you know, as a regulated market provider, um, the LSCG, I mean, for, from, from our perspective, we, 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 I would say that I don't think there's, a, there's a anything specifically that prevents existing NTFs and, and market providers from, you know, providing their services to digital securities in the, in the sense that there's nothing inherent in whether an asset is digital or otherwise that uh, limits its ability to list on a on a trading venue and have it ex have it traded on a on a multilateral multilateral trading facility. It, 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 if if you look at the trading model in the in the crypto assets sphere, it's very much the same. You have centralized venues that pool liquidity. You have buyers and sellers that place bids and, and offers, and then it's really downstream of of trading once you get past you know execution and 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 on on the book, and then it goes into post trade. That's really where the gap is. It's on the settlement side. And so I think I think once you have a solution to solve for, you know, how do you bring regulated CSDs onto the ledger? How do you provide settlement infrastructure for DLT-based assets? Then ultimately, there's nothing stopping, you know, the LSCG, Deutsche Börse, um, you know, six uh, and others to to start to, to to list these these instruments. Okay. Outside so, of will. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's it's such an important topic for. Um... People like uh, like us working with this tokenization industry, and um, hopefully regulation will uh, advance mm -hmm. quickly in Europe to have uh, the possibility to, to to list and trade with order book uh, security, security token. Because today, when you do a, a, a STO security token offering, the question of liquidity is always uh, uh, problematic. There are some possibilities with building board, for instance, but it's still um, an issue to be solved. And uh, I believe um, the risk is that at least in Europe, we see uh, other countries allowing such infrastructures. Uh, maybe, yeah, sorry, yeah. yeah, just said maybe, maybe um, um, let me um, add one thought here because I think I'm not so, so pessimistic on the regulation, um, which, is, which is really happening. So first of all, I think in Germany, um, um, the regulator is quite progressive here working um, on a law for electronic securities, which is going to pass um, um, I think um, still this year. Um, also in the EU with a pilot regime uh, on, on DLT-based market infrastructures, this is also going into the right direction. So um, I'm not so pessimistic. We are not so um, far progressed as uh, Switzerland, for example. Um, always a little bit jealous when I talk to the guys uh, from the Swiss Digital Exchange. Um, but nevertheless, I think um, especially in Germany, I have to say um, unexpectedly, um, but also um, um, elsewhere in the EU, I think it's going into the right direction there. Yes, I agree with uh, Sebastian. We began in, in France with Pact Law, and uh, so it's a law on non-listed. The really point is what we can do on listed securities, but I think we are going on quickly. I think Victoria is looking the time. <laughs> yeah, I think it's time to... To conclude this panel, uh, well, um, very well. I think this is the end of this panel about tokenization of financial assets. And uh, I'd like to thank all of the participants to this panel and to thanks as well the audience uh, for its, its attention. I propose to, to stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your participation, for your discussion. Very interesting. And I think it was also cool to have organizations that are 200 years old, 150. Polymath, I don't know what, how many, like four years, five? Yeah, four, three five. and a half, yeah. <laughs> okay, three and a half. Four. And <laughs> London Stock Exchange also uh, quite old. And then uh, a younger startup. Thank you so much for discussing this. We will continue now in the next session, so you need to go to schedule and then continue there. Thank you so much. <laughs>